there, I am Shelly Kotsky, and today we are at the Kauffman Aqua Culture Center here in Toppin, Virginia. This is located about 45 minutes north of the BIMS main campus and is one of two oyster hatcheries utilized by our program, the Aquaculture Genetics and Breeding Technology Center, or ABC for short. Now this building first opened in 2004. It was funded in part by a challenge grant by the building's namesakes, Luke and Jack Kaufman. It was originally opened as a quarantine facility to explore the possibility of introducing the Asian oyster to the Chesapeake Bay region. Now the reason they were considering doing that is because our native oyster, Crestostria virginica, had had its population so decimated by both human impacts and two diseases called Dermo MSX that there were concerns that it was never going to recover. So long story short, by using this facility as a quarantine hatchery, we were able to explore how this non-native oyster would do here, and in doing so, we figured out that there was actually a good way to reestablish our native population instead, and that's actually through aquaculture. So today we're going to go inside and take a look at the hatchery and see how we do all that here. Our first stop on this tour today is going to be our broodstock holding and conditioning area. That's all these large black tanks behind me, which hold all of the oysters that we're intending to spawn with this year. They're held in these large black bags inside the tank with a constant access to algae through a water flow from the creek behind us. This allows them a constant access to food, but it can be supplemented with the algae that I grow here as well too. Each tank also has an individual temperature controlled heat pump so I can heat or chill the water. Now the reason we want to do that is because oysters, like many animals, use warmer temperatures of spring as the cue that they want to reproduce. Since we're trying to spawn them, we want to be able to control when that actually happens. So by chilling down the water, we can maintain the oysters at their current state and convince them it's winter and that they shouldn't spawn. Conversely, if we wanted to spawn our oysters in January, we could actually heat up the water and add in additional algae so that the oysters will think it's spring and start to put on gametes to get ready to spawn. Our next stop on the tour is our algae room, and this is where we grow all of the food to feed our oysters. Now algae are actually microscopic plants, so that means they need carbon dioxide and sunlight in order to grow, just like any plant that you would have at home. We grow three different species here, and each one has a different role in helping the oysters to be their health healthiest. Now just like you could eat peanut butter and jelly your whole life and you'd survive, you might not be that healthy. That's the same thing with oysters and why we have multiple species for them to consume. It helps them to have a varied diet. So what we do in order to keep our algae growing is we start off with these small flasks that you see behind me. This small volume, we transfer a small bit from it each week to a clean flask that has clean salt water and nutrients in it in order to help the algae bloom or reproduce. From there, after they've had about a week to grow and reproduce, they get dark enough that we can move them into these carboys, where again, they get dumped into a vessel with clean salt water and nutrients. And then lastly, after about another week, they'll go into the cacao walls. And here they're allowed to bloom and grow until they're dark enough like the ones behind me to actually go and feed the oysters. We look at the algae under a microscope and count the number present in order to determine the density that's in the volume given. We use that information to determine how much volume and which species we should feed to our brood stock, as well as what we should feed to our larval stages as well. And this change is based on the density of the oysters in a stock, as well as their age. Now oysters are suspension feeders, which means they actually filter out particles of algae that are in the water and use that as their food source. This is actually also how they breathe as well, by passing the water over their gills to collect oxygen. As you can see, it doesn't take much time for the oysters on the left to filter out all of the algae that's present in this tank. This time lapse occurred over a two hour period. Now any time that we do a spawn, we're doing what's called selective breeding. This is done all the time in agriculture, especially in wheat, berries, melons, and a lot of the other plants that you'll consume. The idea is this. If you have a bunch of animals to select from to breed, you're going to look for the ones that exhibit an external characteristic that you want to pass on to the offspring. So in this case, we have a varied size class of oysters that are all from the same group. But if we want our offspring to all be larger like these ones, we would pick the oysters that are on the larger side to breed together. The idea is, that by taking the animals that exhibit the external characteristic that you want, or the phenotype, you're hoping that that is being reflected in their internal genes, or genotype. 
and that will get passed on to their offspring. Now we can do this for a lot of different characteristics that you see, such as a larger shape, larger oyster, or faster growth rate, a higher meat yield, also salinity tolerances, and disease resistance. Okay, for my last little bit of science today, I'm going to teach you some basic genetics too. So, humans, oysters, and most organisms are what we call diploid, which means they have two sets of chromosomes. The idea is that they'll get one set of chromosomes from their biological male parent and another set from their biological male parent, resulting in equal representation from each parent and a total of two sets of chromosomes. What we do here at the Kaufman Center is predominantly breed polyploid oysters, which means they have more than two sets of chromosomes. Our main focus is breeding tetraploid oysters, which means they have four sets of chromosomes. The same concept applies so that you have instead two sets of chromosomes from the biological male parent and two sets from the biological female parent combining together to make a total of set of four sets of chromosomes with equal representation of each parent. Well, how do you get to those four sets of chromosomes instead of two? That's a little too complicated for this video. And in fact, it's so complicated that we are one of the only groups in the world that actually does this. Our director, Dr. Stan Allen, is one of the scientists that helped to develop the technology to create these oysters in the first place. But the thing to understand is that tetraploids are really important to help make the commercially important product, which is the triploid oyster. So, triploids are made typically by taking a diploid female and combining it with a tetraploid male. Reproductive cells from each of these oysters are, contain about half, contain half the number of chromosomes that the parents do. So if you have a tetraploid oyster with four sets of chromosomes, its reproductive cells are only going to contain two. So those two sets from the male tetraploid are going to combine with the one set from the diploid, and your ending up result is three sets of chromosomes. Now, as I mentioned, your reproductive cells contain half the number of chromosomes than your normal cells do. So since three does not divide very easily in half, that effectively means that triploids become sterile. They do not reproduce. And why that's good is that they can then spend all of their energy into growing larger and growing faster, that they become the commercially important product. So when you go out and eat stuff at a restaurant, when you're eating oysters, you're most likely eating triploid oysters. And the reason this is good also is because we're using aquaculture to create these oysters. These commercial hatcheries make these triploid oysters, and that gives the native oyster populations out in the wild a chance to recover as well, too. So what we do here is we create the diploid broodstock and the tetraploid broodstock and provide them to commercial hatcheries that then create the triploids that you see out in the um, restaurants. Our spawning days require additional assistance and lots of preparation ahead of time, and even so, we'll still take almost the entire day. Our first step is shucking open hundreds of oysters and then looking at them under a microscope to determine whether or not they are male or female. We then take a small gill sample from each of the oysters that we're hoping to use and process them for flow cytometry. Flow cytometry allows us to look at the oyster and determine the number of chromosomes present, which is especially important for tetraploids. Once we've determined if oysters are able to be used or not, we then strip all of the female oysters, which is scraping their gonad into a beaker and rinsing with salt water. The eggs are then poured over a series of two sieves and rinsed with clean salt water. This top sieve is larger and will catch any debris, and all of the eggs will be caught on the bottom sieve. We'll then rinse these back into the beaker and fill with some clean salt water, allowing the eggs to be as clean as possible before we count them. Throughout the spawning process, each of these large beakers is assigned to a single female. We'll then fill the beaker to a known volume and then take a subsample of that beaker to count the eggs. We do this so that we can ensure that each female has an equal contribution to the gene pool. While the eggs are being counted, another person is stripping all of the sperm from the males into individual cups. Once all of the eggs have been counted and the sperm have been stripped and rated from the males, we then split all of our eggs into individual cups and get ready to make our crosses. The crosses are done by matching up males with each individual egg cup, and then by putting a small amount of sperm into each cup based on the rating of how active the sperm is. After allowing the eggs time to fertilize, they're then placed in these tanks with clean salt water and aeration, and all of our glassware for the day washed and set out to dry. 
Now all of our oysters are kept in these large tanks as you see here with information recorded about their parentage. We have room for 50 different tanks which is allows for 50 unique cultures. Inside each tank is clean salt water and aeration and then algae added in based on the age of the culture and the density. You may not be able to see much here but there's oysters inside in the density of about 2 million. And every other day we do a process which is called drops which is draining the tank and catching all of the oysters on a series of graduated sieves. And what you see here, this nice pinkish orange color, is day two oyster larvae. Once all the water from the tank has been drained onto the sieves, we take them over to our working table and use clean salt water to rinse them into these beakers. We then take the, fill the beaker to a known volume and then take subsamples of that water in also a small known volume, usually in microliters. We use that to count the number of oysters and we're looking specifically at their health, namely their, how fast they're moving, the color they have, and the shape as well. We use this to determine how well the oysters are doing and what their survival is. And we use this information to determine how to handle our cultures going forward. And what you see under the microscope is something like this, which is my favorite thing to show people. Oysters, for the first two to three weeks of their lives, actually swim around. And that's what you're looking at here, which is two-day-old oyster larvae. Now, these we typically refer to as D-stage larvae, and you might be able to guess why. It's because they actually have a shape that looks similar to a capital D. After a few days, the oysters will tend to take on more of a round shape, like you see here. And we actually may have to reduce the number of oysters in the culture in order to keep them from overcrowding. After about a week to 10 days, they get this more clam-like shape, as you can see here. The point of the shell is actually referred to as the umbo, and this is the next stage in their development. During the last part of the larval culture, the oysters will develop a light sensing organ called an eye spot, as well as a foot that allows them to seek out a suitable substrate before they metamorphose and become sessile. Our last stop on the tour is our setting room, and this is where the oysters go once they develop that eye spot and their foot. They actually undergo metamorphosis, just like a butterfly does before it comes out of its cocoon, and so that means they change their external appearance entirely. They'll lose their cilia and are no longer able to swim, and instead sink down and attach to the bottom and become sessile or non-moving. Now our setting tanks are also called downwellers, and that's because the movement of the water actually encourages the oysters to go down to the bottom of the sieve and set there on their culch. Culch is actually ground up oyster shell, which looks like grains of sand, and it serves as a cue for the oysters to attach to each individual grain of culch and give us single set oysters as opposed to the large clumps you see in the wild. After the oysters have set, they then get sent down to Gloucester Point and our nursery there. From there, they're deployed out to the field where they're undergoing testing before being utilized by us again in a few years or else deployed to industry. And there you have it. That's our virtual tour of the Coffin Aquaculture Center. I hope you enjoyed seeing some of our day-to-day -day activities as well as learning what the Aquaculture Genetics and Breeding Technology Center at BIMS does. Thank you so much for watching our tour.